Thank you for coming. So today's event is titled Bank of the Future. In, in your view, what does a bank of the future resemble? Well, I believe that um, every industry uh, increasingly is a technology industry. Software is eating everything. And that's true to banking as well. Uh, so effectively, I think a bank of the future is a technology company that offers financial services as opposed to a bank that has technology somewhere in the background. And the reason this is important is because uh, technology is changing the customer experience in every single facet of our life, exactly as uh, your smartphone allow and your apps allow you to get music differently or buy something differently or get a cab differently. It allows you to fulfill your financial expectations differently. And frankly, um, in the future, I think you'll get to a stage where you will not even know that you're acquiring financial services. I call it making the bank invisible. Mm -hmm. And if you can make the bank invisible, the banking service will be so seamlessly embedded in what you really want to do with your life uh, that you will uh, take and, and, and procure the financial services without knowing that you're doing that. Uh, and technology will make all of that possible. So in the future, we, won't, we will no longer walk into bank branches? And we'll well, no we already don't walk into bank branches. When was the last time you went into a bank? So a long time ago. Uh, but here's the big difference. People stopped going to banks. They still went to ATMs for cash. Uh, but, uh, and then people still had to go to their desktop to do their online banking. Today, the bank goes with you in your pocket. And because it goes with you in your pocket, you can actually uh, engage with the customer in context, in location, uh, and therefore you can change the experience completely. In Switzerland, uh, blockchain and the fintech sort of space is really taking off, particularly in Zug. Uh, is it feasible, in your view, that uh, a financial services company, a bank, could it operate entirely on this new technology, on the blockchain? Well, I think the blockchain or any, let's call it distributed ledger technology is very powerful. And it can actually fundamentally alter the notion of value. Uh, today, value is captured in central records. So whether you own a house or not is held by the Registrar of Housing who records somewhere. Uh, similarly, whether you have money or not is recorded in a ledger in a bank. So if you put your name and your number there, that means you have it. In a distributed ledger, you don't need central keepers of records. Um, everybody knows what everybody owns. And so the notion of value changes. You don't need record keepers and central hubs. Uh, and I think you can get there. So if you get there, it will fundamentally change the nature of many institutions, stock exchanges, uh, registrars, but also banks. Uh, but yes, it is possible in the future to be a completely amorphous entity and still provide you know, fundamentals of banking will not change. You still need somewhere to save your money. Uh, you need to move the money around. Uh, and you need to put the money to work. I think those fundamentals will exist. But how those fundamentals get achieved, I think that can be transformed with technologies like blockchain. And many people say that trust is the foremost important thing when it comes to uh, transactions, that you trust the provider, you trust the middleman. If you're building a bank that is invisible, um, can someone trust something they can't see? Is that trust still an important uh, it, That's a really good question. And something that we are trying to grapple with. How do you continue to maintain brand relevance uh, if you are not in the customer's face the whole time? Uh, but if you think about uh, the Intel chip, uh, the chip is inside the computer. You trust the chip to work. You don't necessarily see it. Nevertheless, Intel needed to create a brand. And so they focused on uh, putting a sticker there which said Intel inside, uh, just to remind you that Intel is somewhere in there. Now, how do you get the balance between being seamless in a customer's life, but at the same time retaining brand resonance and brand uh, uh, context? Uh, that's not an easy balance, and we're still working at how, uh, making sure we can achieve that. In terms of uh, taking a shift now onto away from sort of banking of the future, back to traditional uh, financial services, what, how would DBS position itself in, uh, in, in its message, maybe, to the mid-sized companies in Europe that are exporting into Asia? What would be your message for them, and how, how would you propose to, to position yourself? Well, well, you know, 
we realized some time ago, actually one of the, the outcomes of the financial crisis was that a lot of companies, even the, the biggest companies in the world, uh, began to recognize that sometimes it is not sensible to put all your eggs in one basket and have only one global banking partner. Uh, in fact, um, it struck me then because several global treasurers came through Singapore and told me that at the senior most level, they're taking a decision to look for an Asian banking partner. Uh, and that uh, allowed us to build a value proposition to service these kinds of companies, be the partner who can bring Asia to them. Now, what does that mean for a SME or frankly even a large company in Europe? You need a banking partner who can connect you into the Asian systems, uh, who can find you in turn partnerships, who can help you with your receivables, your payables, your distribution points, uh, who can help you with raising capital. Uh, and, you know, for all of these kinds of companies, DBS uh, is a unique partner. We're obviously a, a very strong and trusted brand. Uh, we're one of the strongest banks in the world. We've been rated the safest bank in Asia for 10 years. Uh, we are a high-performing bank. We're 30% owned by Temasek, uh, which is which is very good credentials. But more important, uh, we have 200,000 corporate clients all over Asia. We go deep into the local markets. We have 10 million consumer clients all over Asia. So we can bring a lot of network externalities to the benefit of companies who want to come into Asia. Uh, we, uh, whether it's m and whether it's partnerships, uh, we can find deals which other global banks can't. And if you are looking at it from an individual standpoint, we can find investment opportunities in Asia, which again, sometimes the globals miss because we operate below the, the, the level at which they sometimes operate. Mm, okay. So you go beyond really being a sort of bank that, uh, that's almost invisible to helping the companies in Europe to engage, connect, and find their partners in, in, in the parts of the world where you've been so successful. Yes, and the strategy is proving successful, particularly in areas like, we say, cash management. So for a lot of small companies, managing Asian uh, supply chains is not easy, and managing Asian distribution is not easy. You've got to deal with sales into Indonesia or Vietnam or Philippines. You have currency problems. You have exchange control problems. You have regulatory challenges. You've got to figure how you bring the money out. You've got to figure how you make the payments. Uh, a bank like us is extremely helpful in making sure you get efficiencies in the end-to-end -end process and reach markets that are not easy for you to reach otherwise. So when you first took over the role of, of Chief Executive of DBS uh, Bank in 2009, um, you made a statement that you, you were predominantly an Asian bank and that, that you didn't see a need to position the bank outside of Asia. Uh, that the, what would be more sensible would be to keep it all focused and centered on the location and region that you're at. Do you, is, are we at a different stage now? Are you thinking that maybe DBS might begin to uh, extend into mature markets like Europe? No, actually, our, our fundamental premise hasn't changed. We think our core competency is in Asia. We know Asia well. Uh, we also think that the big opportunities continue to be in Asia. Uh, even ex-Japan, Asia is today 30-35% of global GDP, uh, and it grows at 5 or 6%, real, 7 or 8% nominal. So it's a large pool, uh, it's a fast-growing pool, and it's an area where we know how to do business. So it, it just seems to me that when most people in the world are allocating capital to Asia, uh, it would be ironic for us to allocate capital away from Asia. Uh, now, what we do do, however, um, is that we continue to work with Asian companies who want to go out into the West, uh, the US, Europe. And as we just discussed, uh, we've created a great proposition for European and American companies who want to come and do business in Asia. And that's very helpful because, you know, who doesn't want to do business in Asia? Mm -hmm. So that allows us to expand our remit to companies who are not necessarily Asian companies. But we certainly wouldn't look at banking them in Brazil, for example. I mean, what, what would we bring? Uh, but as those companies want to do business in Asia, we think we are a national partner. And would you would you position yourself here? I mean, would you come out and actually put DBS, make it visible in Europe? In well, we actually sector? have a fairly uh, active presence based out of uh, London so far. Uh, and uh, we cover most of continental Europe from there. It's, we've actually doubled or tripled our presence and the business. Uh, it'll be interesting, you know, once uh, post-Brexit, we'll take a fresh look at what the best way to do that is. But... We do have a large number of European clients today. 
uh, that we built in the last decade uh, on the value proposition I just spoke of. Excellent. Well, we're very pleased to have you here this evening. Thank you again for coming. Very happy to do this. Thank you, Piyush.